And it's about time we've discussed a bizarre creature living inside all of us. Or, I guess, it used to be a creature. Today we're discussing mitochondria, the sausage-shaped structure found inside almost every cell in our bodies that a typical biology textbook will often describe as the powerhouse of the cell. But as we've discussed in some of the previous videos, and as some of the recent studies showed us, that does not seem to be entirely correct, because mitochondrial function seems to be way more profound and involve a lot of physical effects we've never considered before. With the actual question that we're going to be tackling in this video being, um, why do we need sleep? Or why does anything sleep? And why is it important? And though a lot of researchers grappled with this question for decades now, most of the studies so far establish that sleep is purely a kind of a mental reset. A time for the brain to consolidate memories and rest, and to potentially recuperate from any kind of a damage. Yet, today we're going to discuss something entirely different, and yeah, it connects to mitochondria. And so let's talk about these sausage-shaped structures first, and then discuss this new research. And well, as I mentioned, it's always been described as the powerhouse of the cell. They basically take food, or specifically sugar, that we eat, along with the oxygen that we breathe, and convert it directly into chemical energy that we usually call ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It physically looks like this. And in the last video, we actually discussed one of the most mind-blowing propositions about this. Since our whole body relies on this, and since mitochondria are the only ones producing this, it really looks like mitochondria may be responsible for the evolution of all of the complexity in animals on the planet. Or in other words, mitochondria may be driving everything, including potential evolution. So this powerhouse analogy, while catchy, may not be entirely correct. Mitochondria are way more complex, and one of their main functions is actually information processing inside the cell. But as we've discussed before, not just inside one cell, they can even interact and process information outside of the cell while then communicating with each other. And that's because they seem to be also equipped with a lot of different receptors on their surface that can easily sense what's happening inside a cell, can easily receive certain molecules used for communication, and then integrate all of this information, and here's the kicker, then tell the nucleus inside the cell on what to do. Basically, mitochondria direct nucleus and other organelles in order to maintain the health of the cell and thus the health of the entire organism. So I guess here you can also see them as a kind of a brain or the mind of the cell itself. They seem to be controlling the whole show. And so a lot of the recent research describes mitochondria as dynamic, sensing organelles able to perceive, able to integrate information, and then to adapt in order to provide thriving conditions for the cell. Which of course does actually make sense, because we know that billions of years ago, this used to be an independent bacteria. So they very likely maintain a lot of functions, and can still act independently, although in this case also seem to act as a kind of a communal organism. And if you'd like to find out what happened billions of years ago in order to form these first cells, check out one of the previous videos on Archaea in the description below. But in a nutshell, this was a very successful symbiotic partnership that eventually produced us. But it's really this ability to communicate with each other that seems to be the most important, especially when discussing things like sleep. And these discoveries were recently published in a study by Rafael Sarnataro and the team you see here. And so in this new study from University of Oxford, we now seem to have a direct physical explanation for what potentially drives sleep in animals. With the overall conclusion being that the pressure to sleep seems to arise from the buildup of various electrical stresses inside the mitochondria that usually live inside neurons in our brains. But how exactly does all of this work? Well, here we have to remember that mitochondria are still mostly responsible for producing huge amounts of energy. So you can think of them as these massive electrical factories. And in certain brain cells, especially the ones regulating sleep, they do often become overcharged and actually start to leak electrons. You can sort of see some of this happening in this schematic from the study. Now, by themselves, these electrons have a potential to produce something that can be damaging, referred to as reactive oxygen species, also known as free radicals. And usually this electron leak also acts as a kind of a warning signal to the entire cell. And so here scientists seem to have discovered that in some neuronal cells, certain specialized neurons, especially the ones in certain brain locations, sort of act like circuit breakers, able to sense when the electron leak is too high, and able to sense when there's a certain threshold that's been reached. 
in essence telling the entire system that it needs to maybe slow down and take a rest. And so when the leak crosses this threshold, this pushes the brain into sleep mode to prevent overload and to prevent cellular damage. Okay, okay, cool proposition, but do we have any evidence? And the answer is of course yes, because I wouldn't be talking about this if this was just a hypothetical explanation. And to demonstrate this, researchers used fruit flies, essentially one of the most studied species on the planet. Here they were able to directly manipulate energy in certain brain cells, thus to some extent manipulating the electron flow inside mitochondria in tiny brains of these fruit flies. And so by increasing or decreasing electron flow inside mitochondria, it seemed to control how much the flies were sleeping. Here's one of the images in the study showing us how the sleep history seems to alter mitochondrial dynamics. But to confirm this, they were even able to replace the electrons with specific energy from light by using a specific DNA modification that replaced certain proteins. And while not surprisingly, they seem to have observed the same effect. More energy, more leaking electrons, and more sleep. Which to the researchers suggested a clear physical trigger. In this case, the root of everything was basically aerobic respiration, or just the fact that we're breathing oxygen. And so here the study showed that mitochondria, and specifically the stress inside mitochondria, seems to trigger sleep. But this was obviously for a very important reason. And that's because sleep seems to be essential for mitochondrial health. When we sleep, our brain cells apparently shrink in size. And this tends to expand space between them by more than 60%. This unusual increase in space creates perfect conditions for a kind of a flushing system where CSF or cerebrospinal fluid can then easily flow through the brain carrying various waste products and detoxifying all of the neurons. And one of these crucial waste products that's usually clear during sleep is what's known as beta amyloid, a protein very often linked to Alzheimer's. And a protein that also seems to sometimes harm neurons and their mitochondria. And so several studies have previously shown that builds up of beta amyloid tend to happen when we're awake and tend to clear up much faster when we sleep. And so the lack of sleep in this case potentially damages mitochondria inside neurons. And obviously this can also interfere with learning and memory. It's really more serious conditions like dementia that sleep seems to prevent. Although here there's also a really important side note from the study. These mitochondria were not affected in the entire brain and the sleep-controlled neuron processing seems to only work in one specific part of the body, what's known as DFBN, dorsal fan-shaped body, that in flies is very often attributed to sleep and sleep-related activity. So here this is a specific area inside the brain of a fruit fly that we know for a fact affects the sleep. But the thing is, humans don't actually have this part of the brain, and we don't even seem to have a directly equivalent structure, mostly because our brain is just way more complex and doesn't involve a single identifiable structure that directly mirrors the same functions. And so in humans, the brain regions controlling sleep are way more complex and very often involve several parts of the brain. For example, hypothalamus, brainstem, and thalamus all seem to play at least some role. These parts of the brain work together to regulate sleep-wake cycles, but are not necessarily the same as the ones in the fruit fly. And though certain mammalian brain regions have been proposed to be potentially similar, such as what's known as VLPO or ventrolateral preoptic nucleus, the part you see visible in this image, at the moment the conclusions from this study may really only translate to flies and not humans. And so while fundamental metabolic processes are similar, and we do expect very similar neuronal response, generally, in order to trigger sleep in humans, there seems to be just a little bit more complexity. Nevertheless, these findings still help explain certain links and may present us with certain evidence that mitochondria in certain parts of the brain potentially regulate sleep. But in order to prove all of this, researchers would have to explain the exact links in the brain that seem to produce similar effects. And so at the moment, the results from the study may not reflect what happens inside humans. But here there's still a really important question to answer, which potentially applies to humans too. The idea behind feeling of sleep pressure. How does this purely electrical and biochemical process that seems to start inside mitochondria can possibly translate into the subjective sensation of sleepiness that we all feel at night? Since this seems to be a universal phenomenon for pretty much all animals, right now there's a very high chance that the explanation is potentially similar to what was discovered in fruit flies. But the exact neural pathways are obviously unknown. And this can also have an interplay with other mitochondrial roles as well. 
For example, we know that mitochondria are also known as the timekeepers of the cell. They basically set the tempo for various development processes and, of course, maturation of neurons. They're also crucial for immune responses, they also sense bacterial byproducts and regulate cell death, and have a lot of sophisticated roles on top of that. And so here the new question is, how do these various sophisticated roles integrate with the mitochondrial ability to also regulate sleep? Or basically, is there some kind of a master mitochondrial clock, or possibly some kind of a localized clock in certain parts of the brain, that seems to work together to tell us when we have to go to sleep just to prevent any more damage? With all these questions leading us to something that is potentially important for a lot of humans. Mitochondrial dysfunctions and neurological problems, along with certain mental conditions. So, for example, do mitochondrial dysfunctions cause certain conditions such as chronic fatigue or neurological problems, especially the ones involving sleep? So, can we actually explain these fatigue conditions experienced by some people through some kind of a mitochondrial disease inside neurons? And so, for all we know, maybe certain sleep conditions and certain problems that involve sleep could all be resolved by finding a way to treat mitochondria through maybe certain changes in diet, certain breathing exercises, since basically this is all related to oxygen, or possibly certain drugs that can affect how mitochondria process oxygen in the brain. So obviously quite a lot of open questions. But in essence, this still shifts our understanding of sleep and our understanding of mitochondrial effects. Because according to this study, and actually several other studies, sleep is not just some kind of a luxury or mental downtime, it does seem to be critical in regulating biological processes essential for cellular maintenance and essential for maintaining balance inside cells, and specifically essential for preventing cellular damage. It's literally like our body's way to prevent internal electrical meltdown. Which of course also reinforces the idea that a lot of these biological processes are deeply intertwined, and a lot of them seem to be caused by somewhat intelligent functions inside a tiny organelle in our cell. Which means that I guess the next time your body tells you that you're sleepy and it's time for bed, you might want to consider it, because it's potentially mitochondria inside your brain telling you that they're getting just a little bit overloaded. But once again, this is at least based on studies from fruit flies. At the moment, we don't really know how much of this will translate to much more complex animals. But we'll definitely come back and discuss mitochondria once again really soon, because there have been some really exciting discoveries in the last few months, and I just don't want to cram everything in one single video. And so until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access and a few extra videos. Maybe support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.